Hello YouTube! In this video I'm going to examine the problem of other minds. Uh, now there are a few different problems that have come to be called the problem of other minds, but this video will focus specifically on the epistemological question of how can I know that there are other minds? Uh, so I regularly interact with other human beings, I take it that they have minds like mine, but why should I believe this? <laughs> why should I suppose that that they have minds? Um, I mean, and, and the issue is this. Uh, so I seem to experience my own mind directly uh, for my own mental states. I, I like I, I just undergo them. I just experience them. Um, uh, but with other people, I know their minds only through their behaviour. But then I also know that these behaviours could be caused by events other than conscious experiences. And this uh, creates the possibility of a global deception. Maybe, uh, in the case of other people, there is never a mind associated with the behaviour. Uh, that's the general issue. Uh, now, it's worth noting that this problem can sometimes manifest itself quite viscerally. Uh, sometimes, even in our everyday lives, we can be struck by the hiddenness of other people's minds. So, suppose that Verity and Sydney are in a relationship, they've been together for a decade. As far as Verity knows, there are no issues. Sydney has always been kind and loving, always has spoken positively of the future, seems, it seems everything's going great. But then one day, Sydney just leaves, uh, ends the relationship, and Verity discovers a diary in which he talks about how miserable he's always been with her. You know, he's had this diary for years and he's, he's actually just been expressing his, uh, his misery in that diary. Now, this sad tale only makes brutally plain to Verity a veil that is always there, a veil between, you know, our minds and others. I cannot see into other people's minds, so how can I know anything about their minds? That's the problem. Uh, so before we uh, continue, just a quick advert. If you like my channel, uh, you can support me on Patreon or with a one-off donation on PayPal. Uh, if you if you want, I would appreciate it. Uh, if you're interested in private tutoring, I do offer that. Send me an email. Um, and if you want to talk about any of these topics or others, join the Discord. There will be a link to that in the description. Okay, so let's get going. There are at least uh, two sceptical arguments here. Uh, as outlined by Anil Gomes in his article, Scepticism About Other Minds. So, first of all, Gomes says there is the problem of error. Um, I know that there are cases where I judge that somebody has a mental state that they in fact lack. So, think about our story of Verity and Sydney. Verity judges that Sydney is happy, but he isn't. Um, but Verity's evidence for Sydney's happiness is the same as if he was actually happy. Um, so we can say that the good case is a case where I judge that somebody has a mental state and they do have that state. The bad case is a case where I judge that somebody has a mental state but they do not have uh, a mental state, that they do not have that mental state. Um, well then the argument would go like this. Premise one, the good case and the bad case are phenomenally indistinguishable. So when we say phenomenally indistinguishable, this is just a technical way of saying that things seem the same to me in both cases. So, you know, we can tell a story where, you know, so like in one story, Verity uh, has the experiences of being in a really happy relationship and so on, and uh, and it actually turns out that she's correct and Sydney does really love her. And then in another story, Verity has exactly the same experiences. Um, things seem the same way to her, but then it turns out she's mistaken. Sydney never loved her. Um, so, okay, there can be cases where, like, the good case and the bad case are, they seem the same way. Um, and uh, so that's premise one. Then premise two, if the good case and the bad case are phenomenally indistinguishable, then my evidence is the same in both cases. So Verity's evidence for Sydney's happiness is the same in the case where he really is happy and the case where he's not. Um, Premise three, if my evidence is the same in both cases, then nothing can decide which case obtains. So the conclusion is, I can't know whether any given case is the good case or the bad case. Which is to say, I can't know other people's mental states. Um, now this is of course a general sceptical argument. This same kind of argument can be used to motivate scepticism of the external world. In the case of the external world, the bad case 
might be a case of hallucination or the electronic stimulation of a brain in a vat. You know, the, the thought is that the case where we, where, where I am like actually perceiving objects in the external world and the case where I'm merely hallucinating objects in the external world are phenomenally indistinguishable. Um, or this could be used to motivate scepticism of the past. Uh, in, in the case of scepticism about the past, the bad case would be a scenario where the universe popped into existence five minutes ago, um, but, you know, with exactly the properties that it act that it has, right? Um, so, <clears throat> this is a kind of general sceptical argument applied to the case of other minds. Uh, a second argument is the problem of sources. So, in this case, the challenge is that while I can introspect my own mental states and I can observe other people's behaviour, it seems that I have no, there's no obvious link to the mental states of other people. Their mental states are hidden behind a veil of behaviour. Um, so there's no means by which I can access their mental states. Uh, so premise one, if I know that P, then there is a means by which I can know that P. Premise two, there is no means by which I can know other people's mental states. So the conclusion is, I can't know other people's mental states. I can't know that other people have minds. Well, uh, okay then. So that's those are a couple of different ways of like pushing this sceptical challenge. Let's turn now to some potential responses to the sceptical challenge. So the, the classic response to the problem of other minds is the argument from analogy. Uh, this argument has been defended, uh, among others, by John Stuart Mill, Bertrand Russell, A.J. Ayer. Um, so uh, here's how uh, you know John Stuart Mill puts it. How do I know that other people have minds? Well, because, and I quote, first, they have bodies like me, which I know in my own case to be the antecedent condition of feelings, and because, secondly, they exhibit the acts and outward signs, which in my own case I know by experience to be caused by feelings. So the idea is that through introspection, I observe in my own case that particular mental states tend to follow particular bodily states and mental states tend to cause particular patterns of behaviour. Um, so like, I can observe in my own case that if I put my hand on a hot stove, I feel pain. And then when I feel pain, I, you know, cry out, I wince, I maybe nurse the wound, I seek painkillers, whatever. Um, and, but then I can observe similar bodily states and similar patterns of behaviour in others. And I can infer, okay, these states probably have similar, similar effects and similar causes as in my own case. So using my own experience, I establish a correlation between behaviour and mind. Um, I, I can, or in fact, moreover, I can establish that physical events cause mental states and mental states cause behaviours. That's something I observe in my own case. Um, and, and so then I can to make the inference when I see similar behaviours in others, okay, they probably have similar causes. Um, I mean, there, there, there are sort of two kind of rules of thumb that we might be appealing to here. So, first of all, there's the idea that, in general, from similar causes, we may infer similar effects. Um, and then, in general, from similar effects, we may infer similar causes. Um, and, and, and of course, there are going to be exceptions to these principles, right? But these are general rules of thumb for causal reasoning. Um, so, like, I can I can kind of know that, um, all right, like, if you think, think about, say, the human body, right? Well, if I observe uh, somebody sort of smoking, um, and I, I kind of have seen many cases where smoking has led to lung cancer, then I might say, okay, if, if this person, if I'm observing a new person smoking, I can infer that that's probably going to damage their lungs. Um, and, or if I kind of come across um, somebody with uh, a very specific uh, type of lung damage, um, you know, damage that has usually been associated with smoking, then I can infer, okay, well, you know, probably they have been engaging in smoking, right? So similar causes, similar effects, similar effects, similar causes. And, you know, again, these are only rules of thumb. There are exceptions. Um, 
But the thought is that these principles kind of support an argument from analogy. Bodily states and behaviour can be either the cause or the effect of mental states. So from similar bodily states and behaviours, we infer similar mental states. There are extremely complex patterns of behaviour that we see in other people. Many of these behaviours are similar to my own behaviours, so I infer similar causes uh, in, the, in the mental states that drive the behaviour. This is the general idea of the argument from analogy. Now, uh, the argument from analogy has uh, a number of issues. Um, so, <clears throat> a first objection, first objection, is that the argument involves an inference from a single case. Uh, it it seems to be a hasty generalization, right? I if, if I'm giving the argument from analogy, then I'm making a generalization about a whole population, namely all human beings, on the basis of just one example, and that seems clearly illegitimate. I mean, like, suppose I'm five foot six, and then on this basis I infer that all people are five foot six. Or suppose I'm a fan of Frank Zappa, and on this basis I infer that all people are fans of Frank Zappa. Um, or, you know, suppose that I, uh, I smoke, right, I'm smoking, I get lung cancer, and then I infer that all smokers get lung cancer. Um, well, obviously, that, that wouldn't be a good justification for believing that smoking causes lung cancer, right? Like, no, if you want to establish that smoking causes lung cancer, you, you have to kind of look at the whole population. You have to look at a lot of people um, in order to make that inference. Um, so, you know, clearly these sorts of inferences, inferences on the basis of just one single case are not good inferences. Um, you know, we can't, we can't make claims about all people, all human beings, on the basis of observations of just one human being. Um, so this is the basic worry. Now, one of the things Mill actually points out, however, is that there do seem to be cases where we can infer from a single instance, from a single case. Um, what's going on in these cases, though, is that we have background knowledge that justifies us in assuming that the single sample is representative of the whole population. So one example of this might be, let's say, you know, we, um, I don't know, invent some, we, we discover some new element, say, and I, um, I observe that a sample of this element melts at 400 degrees. I infer that in general, other instances of this element will melt at 400 degrees. Maybe that's okay. Um, but what's going on here is that I have some reason to think that this sample that I'm dealing with is representative of the whole. And you know, my reason in this case is, well, melting point is determined by atomic structure. So like, you know, I have a, a general theory of chemistry, which tells me melting point is determined by atomic structure. And then this sample is going to have the same atomic structure as other instances of the element. I mean, obviously, right, elements are defined by their atomic uh, properties. So, um, so, so the thought is, well, you know, in this particular case, I have just one sample of this element, but maybe it's okay for me to make, you know, like once I establish, okay, this has a melting point of 400 degrees, I can then infer that all other samples are going to have a melting point of 400 degrees. Um, but what that's supported by is this background knowledge that allows me to treat the single sample as representative of the whole population with respect to melting point. Now, the trouble in the context of other minds is that it really doesn't seem like I'm entitled to just assume that I'm representative of the whole population with respect to my mind um, or with respect to my behaviour. I mean, that's this is exactly what the sceptic is asking me to justify, right? This is exactly what the sceptic is calling into question. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to need some re So in order to address the sceptic, I'm going to need to present some reason for thinking that I am representative of the whole population with respect to mind or behaviour. Um, and it's not really clear how the argument from analogy is going to do that. Um, so another way to respond to this, though, is we might deny that the argument from analogy really does proceed from a single case. I mean, you know, so <clears throat> clearly we don't draw an analogy on the basis of a single case of behaviour. It's not that I experience pain, which then leads to behaviours like wincing and nursing the wound, and then from this alone I infer that this type of behaviour is caused by pain. So it's not as if, you know, okay, put my hand on a hot stove, I cry out and wince, and then from that experience alone, I infer that, you know, hand on the hot stove leads to pain and pain leads to crying out and wincing. Rather, I experience many pains, followed by many wincings. And 
this is going to give me a correlation between mental states and behavior. Many, many instances of mental of the mental states leading to the behavior. Now, the issue, of course, is so, you know, I mean, in some sense, this isn't like a single case, right? Like there's been many ca cases of pains and pain behavior in my life. Um, but there's still an issue here, which is that this inference, this correlation rather, is found in a single person. Um, but then we might question the relevance that it's a single person. After all, people change radically over time. I have very different features now to what I had 20 years ago. Um, in terms of my bodily and behavioral states, Kane Baker at age 31 might have more in common with Sydney at age, age 31 than with Kane Baker age 10. So there are radical changes over time in my bodily states, in my behaviours, in my mental states. Nevertheless, there are certain correlations that remain stable, such as that pain is followed by wincing. So like Kane Baker age 10, when he experienced pain, he then exhibited behaviours like wincing. Kane Baker age 31, when he experiences pain, he then exhibits behaviours like wincing. Um, and so like, why shouldn't this be taken as a, a kind of s series of cases? Um, yes, it's a single person, but that person has changed over time. If Kane Baker at, at some time T1 is relevantly different from Kane Baker at time T2, then, you know, c couldn't I then take that as being kind of different uh, different instances on which to base the argument from analogy. So the, the thought here is, well, you know, yes, it's an inference from a single person, but this doesn't entail that it's an inference from a single case. This doesn't enta entail that it's a <coughs> problematic, hasty generalization. <coughs> so maybe that's uh, one way of dealing with the uh, hasty generalization objection. Um, okay, then, a second objection <coughs> to the argument from analogy is that there are a variety of cases where the correlation between mental states and behaviours fails to hold. Um, so, first of all, there are cases where behaviours are produced, but there is no accompanying mental state. So think about calculators, robots, these language learning models like ChatGPT. I can get ChatGPT to produce a poem where if I had written that poem, you would say, okay, you know, you would attribute certain mental states as preceding that behaviour. You know, you would, you would attribute like you know, maybe maybe thought, maybe kind of creativity, maybe, well, I mean, I'm not sure how creative ChatGPT's poems are, but, you know, I mean, you, like, you would have attributed some pretty sophisticated mental states to me if I had produced a poem like what ChatGPT can produce. Um, so, uh, you know, I, now, I wouldn't take it that ChatGPT has a mind. I mean, or at least if it does have a mind, I mean, it's nothing like my mind. Um, uh, so, you know, ChatGPT is producing similar output to what, in my case, would require mental states, or at least I take it it would require mental states, but I'm not attributing any such mental states to it. Now, of course, I mean, there are significant differences between ChatGPT's behaviour and the behaviour of human beings, and there are plenty of things I can do that ChatGPT can't do, but... ChatGPT, I mean, it is capable of output that traditionally would be taken to be indicative of mentality. I mean, I mean, look, you know, imagine, imagine kind of taking a poem written by ChatGPT or taking some I don't know, code or something written by ChatGPT or a, or a letter written by ChatGPT and showing that to, you know, someone from the 1700s. They would have no doubt at all that this has been produced by a person with a mind. Um, so, so this, so this fact then seems to weaken the correlation between uh, mental states and behavioural output. It's worth noting as well that even among humans, there are cases of behaviours without the normal mental states. So think about cases of sleepwalking or maybe highway hypnosis. It seems that people can perform sometimes fairly complex actions like automatically, at least without reflective consciousness, you know, without thinking about it in the traditional sense. Um, then, of course, there are cases of intentional deception. People can lie uh, or they can, you know, act. <laughs> um, in this case, there are, we assume, conscious mental states behind the lie or behind the acting, but they're not the normal mental states. Um, so I know that the apparent behaviour exhibited by an actor on the stage is not actually caused 
by pain, but it may be indistinguishable from actual pain behavior. Um, again, this is just something that weakens the correlation. It blocks us from tying specific mental states to specific behaviors. Finally, there are cases where mental state, so, so in, in the previous cases, you know, we had the behavior without this traditional mental state. Then there are cases where there are mental states without the usual behavior associated with it. So one obvious case is I fall asleep every night and dream. During the dream, I have intense feelings and emotions, but you will just see me lying still in my bed while my eyes flutter rapidly. Or consider uh, anesthetic awareness. These are, so, so there are some rather disturbing cases of people who are fully conscious, even while under anesthetic during surgery. For these people, all of their behavioral responses are suppressed but they're fully aware of the events in the environment and the pain of the surgery. Um, this is extremely rare, I should say. <laughs> so, um, you know, probably not something you need to be too troubled about if you have any surgeries coming up. Um, so it's very, very rare, but, you know, it does happen. And in this case, there are some pretty extreme mental states, uh, but no associated behavior. Um, so, so the point of this objection is, well, look, even if it is legitimate to infer from a single case, we actually have good reason to doubt. We, we have positive reasons to doubt the correlations that the argument from analogy requires. Okay, a third objection. Is it true that I observe similar bodily states and similar behaviours in others? Well, one thing to notice is that this observation is certainly not direct. If you think about what is actually available to you on present evidence when you can if you compare yourself to other people it, it's not clear that you do have similar bodily states and behaviors um, so there's a book called on having no head by douglas harding where he talks about a realization he had that uh he doesn't have a head um and, and he suggests that you too can see that you don't have a head um so uh, if i if i look at my body in terms of my immediate experience, right? What do I see? Well, I'm going to see my feet at the sort of center or, or the top of my visual field. Then kind of as I, as I kind of look at the rest of my body, I'm going to see legs. I'm, I'm going to see a torso and arms. Um, and then I'm kind of going to get to like the top of my torso. And then there's just this empty space. There's this kind of invisibility where the visual field as a whole is located. So this like weird thing happens when I, I, I look up my torso and then I get to where, you know, like I assume that my head is. But what happens is, is that instead of seeing a head, my awareness just it, like gets, it, it, I become aware of like the visual field as a whole, including the body that I've just looked at. So you know, so I don't see a head at the very least. Like it's like what exactly it is that I'm aware of is a bit weird, right? But it's like it's like this empty space, this invisibility, or maybe visual field as a whole. Um, I can see a nose, but the nose that I see is very different to the noses of other people. Other people's noses are protrusions from their faces. My nose is these two blurry masses at the side of my visual field. Or consider things like talking. When you talk, a mouth moves. When I talk. I mean, there's like some set of tactile sensations in, you know, some somehow in the empty space. Uh, there's a vibration in my chest. It's very different to what's going on when you're talking. So in terms of what I'm immediately observing, there seems to be a significant difference between, you know, my bodily states, my behaviours, and your bodily states and behaviours. Now, of course, the obvious response to this is, well, you know, look, um... I, I'm justified in assuming that we share behaviours because I'm first making an inference to a particular model of how the world works. And I mean, okay, fair enough. It is at least consistent with the evidence to suppose that I have a body just like yours. You know, the reason why I see these two blurry masses is because that's just what a nose looks like. Um, that's what a nose just like yours looks like when observed from a particular vantage point. That is, when it is placed between two eyes. Um, but recall that the assumption of the argument from analogy is that there's, uh, you know, so there's, the, the, what the argument from analogy is saying is, okay, there's observation of one's own mental states and one's own behaviours and other people's behaviours. So, like, I, I directly observe the correlation between mental states and behaviour in my own case. I directly observe the behaviour of other people is similar to mine. 
the point of this objection is actually this is just false. When I describe behaviours in a way that gives me a similarity between my behaviour and the behaviour of others, this in itself requires a pretty substantial theoretical inference. I mean, it's not an inference that you would normally be aware of, um, but you know, you are assuming a substantive theoretical model when you take it that your behaviour is similar to the behaviours of others. Um, you know, you're already inferring far beyond what is present in just immediate experience. Um, so, so then the, the, the sort of challenge would be, okay, well, I mean, if that's sort of already some, if there's already some sort of inference there, then, uh, it, you know, like, that's going to kind of, undermine this idea that, well, we just have straightforward access to, you know, my own mental states, my behaviours, and other people's behaviours. Um, okay, so that was the argument from analogy. Let's turn to a second response to other minds' scepticism. Second response is given by behaviourism. Um, now, behaviourists traditionally begin not really with the epistemological question of how I can know that other people have minds, but with a more conceptual question. So they're going to ask, well, what exactly are mental concepts and how are they learned in the first place? How is it even possible to attribute mental states to others? Now, in order to think about how mental concepts work, uh, Wittgenstein gave a famous analogy of the beetle in the box. So suppose that everybody has a box and in the box is a thing they call a beetle. Nobody can look into anybody else's box and nobody can relate what is in their box to other publicly observable things. So nobody can describe what is in their box except by calling it a beetle. So what this means is the only way a person can know what counts as a beetle is by looking inside their box and observing the beetle. Now notice that um, given the way this language works, it's possible that everybody has something different in their box. It's possible that what is in your box is constantly changing. It's even possible that for some people there's nothing in the box at all. Um, so the word beetle in this language doesn't name a thing. I mean, it, it's maybe more like a kind of, ter it's like an abbreviation for just, for the phrase, whatever is in the box. Um, but the key point is that since the content of the box is totally private and inaccessible to others, the content of the box is irrelevant to the meaning of the term beetle. Because, you know, like, like the word beetle, it gets its meaning from its, you know, role in a public language. And like what's going on inside people's boxes is just irrelevant to the use of that term. Um, it plays no role in the meaning of that term. Because again, like everybody could have something different in their box. Some people might have nothing in their box, but they, you know, they'd still say, okay, I have a beetle in my box. Um, so, now, the thought of this analogy is, well, you know, the box is supposed to be um, kind of analogous to, uh, I, I guess, you know, the mind, the beetle is analogous to, to private, to private mental experiences. And in the same way that beetle cannot be the name for some private, inaccessible thing, the same is supposed to go for mental terms. Mental terms cannot get their meaning by referring to private inner states. In order for a term to be meaningful, it must have public rules of usage. It must be possible for other people to check whether the term is being used correctly or incorrectly. And so the term must refer to publicly observable states. Mental terms like pain, happiness, belief, desire, and so on, they acquire their meaning from observations of people's behavior. I mean, if you think about it, think about how children are taught these terms, right? Children observe behavior and they are taught the correct application of the term pain on the basis of seeing this behavior. Um, you know, so for the behaviorist then, behavior is a, a criterion of the mind. Exhibiting particular patterns of behavior is just what it is to be in pain. There's nothing more to pain than what is expressed in publicly observable behavior. So, so like all it means to say that Verity is in pain is that she's exhibiting particular patterns of behavior. She's wincing, she's crying out, she's nursing a wound, she's seeking painkillers and so on. So the traditional assumption is, you know, like, I know my own mind through direct introspection. My own mind is this private space inaccessible to others. Then some inference is required to know the minds of other people. The behaviorist rejects this picture entirely. For the behaviorist, um, the way that like the way that we understand mental terms, the way that these terms get their meaning is actually through observations of 
other people and I, I suppose of, of ourselves, but certainly not of like some private inner space that nobody else has any access to. Um, so notice that if I was to ask the question um, in this beetle language, if I was to ask the question, do other people have a beetle in their box? That question would just be nonsensical, given how the term beetle is used. It, so in order for that question to make sense, we would have to assume that beetle designates some specific object, that it designates some object that, you know, might be in the box or might not be in the box. But actually, that's not how the term works. What is in the box, if anything, is irrelevant to the meaning of the term beetle. The same goes for, pri for, for these mental terms. What is happening in some private, hidden inner space is irrelevant to these terms. These terms refer ultimately to public observable events. Um, okay, so I mean, it should be fairly clear how this solves the problem of other minds. For the behaviorist, the problem doesn't really even, even arise. There is no distinction between a normal human being who has a mind and a uh, philosophical zombie that exhibits behavior indistinguishable from a normal be human being, but who has no mental states. The mind is not some hidden thing that lies behind people's behavior. Rather, it is an assembly of those patterns of behavior. It's a, it's kind of a, 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 like when we use mental terms, these are ways of like abstracting from behavior, classifying behavior um, in useful ways. So since we're granting that other people do indeed exhibit the right patterns of behavior, well, we know that other people have minds. Um, there is no problem with other minds. Uh, like I, I can just, and basically I can just directly perceive other minds. Like when you stub your toe and cry out, I just directly perceive that you, you're in pain. Um, now, uh, that's that's behaviorism then. Um, now, there are many objections to behaviorism. Uh, I suppose the most sort of obvious objection is that behaviorism just seems to deny what is kind of plainly clear to all of us. So I, I, I think the initial reaction to, to behaviorism is to say, well, you know, surely there's more to my own pain than mere pain behavior. Like my own pain impresses itself upon me in a far more visceral way than my observations of the pain behaviors of others. Uh, behaviorism has obvious difficulty accounting for the first personal character of our own experiences. I mean, it seems to just outright deny that, that there is any such first person character, that there are any such experiences. But that, I would imagine, strikes most people as, uh, as, as rather absurd. Um, so one way to elaborate this objection is, you know, look, even if we do have knowledge of other minds, we still want to allow that people have a kind of privileged access to their own mental states. Um, I, I mean, so maybe we can say that other people have some sort of access to my mind, but the vast majority of the time, it seems clear that I know my own mind better than other people know it. Indeed, I have a kind of authority over my own mind. If I think that I'm experiencing pain, like I sincerely believe I'm experiencing pain, then that's a very strong reason to think that I actually am in pain, regardless of what further behavior I'm exhibiting. Moreover, I don't need to consider my own behavior to figure out whether or not I'm in pain. When I put my hand on a hot stove, I just feel the pain. Just It's like right there, and then I retract my hand. It's not that, you know, I put my hand on the hot stove, I retract my hand, and then I make the inf and then I'm like, oh, that's pain behavior, so I must be in pain. No, I'm just feeling the pain. Um, so maybe another way to think about this is, suppose you're at a party with some friends and you start to feel a pain. Maybe it's like indigestion or something. But, you know, you're not really in the mood to complain about things. It's a fun night. You don't want to ruin the night. So you just sort of ignore it. You suppress the pain. Uh, you don't tell anybody that you're in pain and it doesn't manifest in your behavior because you're just sitting down talking. Um, it's easy enough to hide this pain because it's fairly mild. Now, the question would be, how do you know that you're in pain? Presumably not by observing your own behavior. No, you just have the you have this direct experience of the mental state of pain. Um, and the worry is, is that behaviorism is going to have difficulty accounting for cases like this. Um, now, there are various other objections to behaviorism. I won't go through them here. I have a, a video on behaviorism that I will I will link in the comments that outlines the objections in much more detail. Um, but I do want to make one point about the behaviorist solution to the problem of other minds. Um, to answer the problem of other minds, we don't need to defend 
uh, a kind of global behaviorism. We don't need to defend the idea that all mental states are reducible to behavior. It is sufficient in responding to the problem of other minds that some mental states are reducible to behavior or manifest directly in behavior. After all, nobody claims that I can know everything about the mind of another person, or at least that's very rare that anyone will claim that. Um, you know, so no matter how well I know you, I, I'll probably take it that some aspects of your mind are hidden to me. So, okay, maybe there are some private inner states that are forever hidden to others. That's no matter, provided we can give a behaviorist analysis of at least some mental concepts. And so this suggests that behaviorism may have better prospects as a solution to the problem of other minds than as a general theory of the mind, provided there are at least some mental states that can be analyzed in behaviorist terms, there's your, that's just it, that's the solution to the problem of other minds. Um, but yeah, behaviorism is sort of out of fashion these days, um, so let's turn to some uh, other, other options. So <clears throat> a third option for responding to other, to, to problem of other minds, is that we can come to know other minds through inference to the best explanation. According to this response, we postulate mental states in others as a kind of theory. So there is the theory of folk psychology. This is our common sense understanding of other people um, uh, as, you know, other people as being driven by beliefs, desires, emotions, moods, pains, and so on. Um, the theory of folk psychology is part of the best explanation of other people's behavior. So the minds of other people are unobservable to me, but consider the sciences. Many theories postulate unobservable things. If you look at science, you'll see talk of electrons, black hole singularities, genes, dark matter, laws of nature, uh, and so on. Now, clearly, you know, I'm never going to directly observe an electron or a black hole singularity. So uh, why do I, you know, why do I believe in these entities? Well, the standard answer is believe in those entities because those entities play a crucial role in well-tested predictive and explanatory theories. They provide the best explanation of the things that we observe. Um, the best explanation of the observations of white streaks in the cloud chamber appeals to particles like electrons. So we'd say, you know, an electron, a charged particle, enters the cloud chamber, it attracts other molecules, and this creates a condensation trail, you know, something like that. So science proceeds by noticing puzzling phenomena, such as white streaks in a cloud chamber, and then postulating causes of the phenomena. Those causes are often unobservable. Now consider minds. So there's a puzzling phenomenon. Uh, a phenomenon that cries out for explanation, and that's the complex patterns of behavior exhibited by human beings. Postulating mental states as causes of behavior is a simple, useful tool for predicting and explaining this behavior. Um, if, I, if I think Verity is angry with me, I can predict that she will shout at me. Um, I can predict that things will go more smoothly for me if I avoid Verity. If I take it that Sydney is scared of the dark, I can predict that he will sleep with the lights on, or that he will want me to accompany him when he goes to dark areas of the house. These are simple examples, of course, but they're, I mean, they're simple primarily because all of us are so accustomed to interpreting others in these terms. We begin to learn folk psychology from the earliest years of our lives. We apply it in all our interactions with others. So, you know, we're just like we're just used to this theory, but actually it's a very, um, you know, it's a very sophisticated theory. Um, and so, so the idea is, is that, you know, postulating internal mental states of other people is the best explanation uh, of their behavior. Um, it's worth noting an important benefit of the best explanation approach, which is, I believe not just that other people have minds, but also that other species, potentially very different from me, have minds. Um, or, you know, people who exhibit bizarre forms of behavior. Um, you know, I, I take it that they have minds as well. Like if somebody is just behaving in a very, very strange way, I mean, that, I'm still going to think they have a mind. The argument from analogy is going to struggle with such cases um, behaviorism will run into the problem that it's not obvious why we should take that particular behavior as mental. Um, but it's easy to see how, you know, so the best explanation of the behavior of an octopus, it's easy to see how you might think that the best explanation of that behavior 
will propose mental states as the causes of the octopus's behavior, even though the octopus's behavior is very different from mine. There's not really any analogy between my behavior and the octopus's behavior. Um, okay, let's turn to some objections to the best explanation view. Well, the first worry here um, concerns the general form of argument, inference to the best explanation. Best explanation is notoriously vague. What exactly are the criteria for best explanation? Well, we have to judge theories against various theoretical virtues. So there's empirical adequacy, explanatory power, simplicity, uh, the theory must not be ad hoc, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of debate about what should go on this list. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate about how the entries on this list are to be interpreted and the different weights that they should be given. Um, so, you know, here's a simple example if you take simplicity. Well, what the hell is simplicity? I mean, there's an obvious sense in which it's simpler to postulate just one mind rather than many billions of minds that are all more or less similar to mine. Um, equally, there's an obvious sense in which it is simpler to say... I'm not radically different from other human beings. There's nothing special about me. Um, behavior has, like, all behavior has similar causes. There's nothing special about me. Um, so, so we have these like different senses of simplicity here. Does simplicity tell against postulating other minds or in favor of postulating other minds? That's open to debate, right? So, you know, the, so one worry here is, well, we just don't really have a, a kind of good understanding of of inference the best explanation or um, that maybe there's a worry that like labeling a theory best the best explanation is a kind of rationalization like if I want to defend some particular theory I can always interpret the theoretical virtues in some way or weigh them in some way such that those virtues tell in favor of that theory um, I've got again a number of videos where I talk about the difficulties with inference the best explanation see the comments for those um, okay a second objection Let's suppose that we have a good theory of what's required for inference to the best explanation. Well, now there's the worry that postulating other minds is just not the best explanation for other people's behavior. Um, like, so, it, however you, whatever you take inference the best explanation to involve, like, whatever you, th whatever you think the theoretical virtues are and, and how, you know, how they're to be weighed and interpreted, the worry is that postulating other minds is just not going to come out as the best explanation. Okay, so the first point here is there are other ways of predicting and explaining behavior that do not attribute mental states. Uh, again, see another video for this. I, I detail this in my video, Challenges to Folk Psychology. Um, so, okay, how can, we, how can we predict behavior without attributing mental states to others? Well, one idea is that we appeal to situational scripts. For example, when I enter a restaurant, I know how the waiter will behave, and I know how to interact with the waiter, and this doesn't seem to require figuring out anything about the waiter's mental states. All it requires is knowing what role waiters play in the restaurant institution. So I have a general understanding of what restaurants are and what roles people have at restaurants. So, the, so waiter is a specific role that somebody has at a restaurant. Um, and the, so the thought is, you know, I have a kind of script for what happens in restaurants. And on the basis of this script, you know, that's, well, that's what I use to, to predict how people at the restaurant will behave. Like, my script is going to include, like, general descriptions of what role waiters have, what waiters do. It's going to include general descriptions of the, you know, the role of customers and what customers do and how they interact with waiters. And that's what I'm using um, to predict the behavior of the waiter. Or consider driving. I can correctly predict how other people will drive. That's literally a matter of life and death. But I don't need to think about the mental states of other drivers. In order to predict people's behavior on the road, all I need to know are the rules and conventions of driving, and I need to have some confidence that other drivers will generally follow those rules and conventions. With that, um, you know, that's it. Like, that's all I need to know how to predict people's behavior on the road. And I can know these things just on the basis of observations of driving behavior. Uh, notice that we're now developing self-driving cars. Um, and 
probably we won't attribute mental states to these, or at least if they do have mental states, they're nothing like our mental states. Um, but imagine, you know, imagine that you're actually driving around in a world where there are both human drivers and AI drivers, well, it's not really going to make any difference whether the entity that's controlling the other car um, is another person or an AI, right? Like the, me the mental states of the thing that's controlling the other car are just irrelevant. Um, you know, how, like, the, the prediction you make of what that car is going to do is probably going to be basically the same in both cases. Um, you're probably not even going to think about it, actually. Uh, like, if you're actually out there driving, you're just going to see another car and you kind of know, all right, I know what the rules and conventions of the roads are. I expect that this other car will follow those rules and conventions. Um, uh, and then there are there are other cases where, you know, I can predict behavior just by a sort of simple induction from past behaviors. So let's say that, you know, I'm watching a movie with my friend. I predict that he's going to watch until the end. What mental states do I attribute to him? Well... He doesn't need to be enjoying the movie. Maybe my friend often watches movies that he says he dislikes. Instead, my prediction is based on the observation that, in general, he watches movies to the end. You'd make a very different prediction about my behaviour. I often stop watching movies, even when I really enjoy them. Um, so these are just some common sense examples of how behaviour can be understood without appealing to mental states. Um, you know, we can kind of predict, explain the behaviour of other people without attributing minds to them. And... So this suggests, you know, folk psychology isn't the only approach, not even in our everyday lives. Then when we look to the sciences, well, folk psychology is arguably on even worse footing. I mean, if our goal is, develop a theory, is to develop a theory that predicts and explains behaviour, we might expect that the best theory will appeal not to mental states, but to brain states. And brain states can be described without invoking mental terms at all. You know, we can talk about collections of neurons or action potentials or synaptic transmissions, neocortical circuits, Brodmann areas. Um, now, of course, we can relate neuroscientific descriptions to folk psychological descriptions. We could talk about how beliefs, say, are realised in the brain, but we don't have to. <laughs> we don't have to do that. Um, and that actually seems to be something that's like, uh, you know, that's something that's a kind of addition to neuroscience right like neuroscientists is going to tell you what's going on in the brain and then maybe we can we can then sort of relate this to our traditional understanding of mental states but you could just say well look the we just have this explanation or this theory which describes brain states and describes how that manifests in uh bodily changes and that's that's enough um and 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 in fact that's going to allow for predictions that are far more you know, fine-grained and surprising than what we get from attributing mental states. For example, we know that rapid damage to Broca's area, which is a region of the brain involved in speech production, will lead to expressive aphasia, where a person understands language and knows what they want to say, but cannot generate speech themselves. Or we may be able to see how stimulating different parts of the nervous system will lead to specific pain experiences, you know, pain associated with a delta fibers is sharp, like a stabbing sensation, while pain associated with C delta fibers is more like, you know, dull or burning. Um, but the key thing is, is that in these cases, you know, we don't have to, um, we, we don't have to uh, interpret this as, we don't have to interpret this in terms of the other person having a mind, right? We can just say, well, stimulating different parts of the nervous system is going to lead to different uh, pain behaviors it's going to lead or, or different verbal behaviors you know so the person will say they'll express the words that oh you know that pain is sharp or that pain is dull or whatever um so uh so one thought here is well there are going to be explanations of behavior that do not attribute minds um that are better than the explanations that do attribute minds um, and of course, the other issue here is, uh, and this has been discussed by eliminative materialists like Paul and Patricia Churchland, is that folk psychology does appear to have some significant drawbacks as a theory. Um, for one thing, the primary scope of folk psychology is to normal adult language using humans. Much of folk psychology involves attributing propositional attitudes, that is, sentences in the head. If I believe that there is food in the cupboard, or desire that there is food in the cupboard, or hope that there is food in the cupboard, I'm taking different attitudes to the proposition, there is food in the cupboard. So it's like I've got a sentence in my head, 
there is food in the cupboard. And then I can you know, believe that that sentence is true or desire that that sentence is true. Um, but, you know, this gives us very little insight into babies or animals uh, because they don't seem to have sentences in their head. I mean, we might say that a dog believes that there is food in the cupboard, but that, I mean, if you think about it, that seems kind of metaphorical, right? Because clearly a dog, you know, a dog's not going to have in its head the proposition that there is food in the cupboard. A dog, it seems, is not going to share our concepts, food and cupboard and inness. I mean, maybe there's something else going on in the dog <laughs> that, you know, like approximates these concepts. But it's, I mean, it certainly doesn't have like language. It doesn't have linguistic concepts. So it's not going to have a proposition in its head. So, you know, um, the, the folk psychology's attribution of propositional attitudes is something that only applies to adult language using humans. So scope is limited. Moreover, even for adult humans, folk psychology has limitations. It's given us very little understanding of mental illnesses and how to treat them or the causes of crime, or how learning occurs, or why we dream, or how memories are encoded. To answer these questions, we have to turn to alternative theories. You know, we've got to turn to, I don't know, neuroscience, say. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a final point here is, you know, it's worth reflecting on, like, how much do you actually, like, understand and predict about the behaviour of even normal adult humans? I mean, actually, a lot of behaviour is just totally unpredictable. If we're having a conversation, I'm not going to be able to predict exactly what you will say next, or even how long you'll want to remain on a general topic, or how long we'll continue talking. You know, I'm not able to predict exactly when you'll get hungry, or exactly what food you will choose. Uh, now, of course, as I get to know people better, more of their behaviour will be predictable. Um, but that's partly just because I become more familiar with their behaviour. I mean, it's always worth thinking about, like, you know, next time you're kind of interacting with another person, um, kind of reflect on, like, okay, how much of their behaviour am I actually predicting, right? And how kind of precise are the predictions that I do make? Um, you might find that there's actually, you know, relatively little that you predict. Like, maybe in very general terms, you know, I can say, well, I make the prediction that this person is going to treat me kindly or something. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, again, like, there's a, there's a great deal of behaviour that is just, you know, beyond our, our predictive capacities. Um, okay, so, general point is this. In many cases, I do not predict other people's behaviour. Where I do make predictions of behaviour, it's not obvious that this is based on attributing mental states. And even if it is based on attributing mental states, there might be better theories that would allow for more fine-grained predictions. So, um, you know, the, 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 the inference of the best explanation response is, well, you know, we, we're justified in believing that other people have minds on the basis of inference of the best explanation, but it's not obvious that inference of the best explanation actually does justify this. It's not clear that it does justify, you know, the folk psychological theory that involves attributing mental states to other people. And that is the problem of other minds. Um, and that is uh, all I have to say for today. So thank you for watching. I will see you in the next video, whenever that may be. Goodbye.